John, let's talk about the technology that is going into these robo taxis. Uh, it seems like there's a real convergence of technologies. You know, you've got an EV, now you've got AI, now you've got LIDAR, you've got all sorts of different technologies that are combining to make a robo taxi and make it viable much faster than maybe we thought a few years ago. Yeah, certainly, I'd say so. It's a really interesting convergence of technologies, like you say, in terms of like the, the different sorts of algorithms and software and the emergence of machine learning and AI has contributed a lot to that in terms of using neural networks to perceive the environment around you and then also act accordingly. And then on the hardware side, uh, the cost decreases in LiDAR, the performance increases also in terms of camera and radar and EV technology as well with powertrains, batteries. Uh, yeah, it's definitely really interesting and it will definitely, these are all things which are going to contribute to, I guess, robo taxis now and in the future. One of the interesting things about the Chinese industry is we're starting to see battery companies get into robo taxis, building robo taxis. I guess BYD would be a, a an obvious one because they you know, they're, they're a big EV maker. But even CATL, I understand, and other com uh, companies are looking at getting uh, doing robo taxis as well. Yes, for sure. I mean, BYD definitely has the advantage that it's a major EV uh, EV manufacturer. And now, surprise, like if you look at their private vehicles, their advanced driver assistance systems, their ADAS systems as well, they're very advanced with their existing cameras and radars. CATL is a really interesting one because, I mean, they produce most of the batteries, not only for Chinese OEMs, but also for OEMs in Europe, in Germany, and in also in, in the US, they're major suppliers to all of these. I think in CATL's case, they have a massive collaboration uh, with some other companies as well, who are also providing, for example, cloud computing services and uh, AI services. And while CATL is, is supplying what it's very good at supplying at scale, battery technology, chassis, um, to supply for these robot taxis. And I think it's a great example of sort of that increased collaboration, which uh, China seems to go through very quickly. And yeah, it definitely leverages the strength from all different sides of the supply chain. There's an angle to this that, that I find fascinating because in 2018, I interviewed the city of Calgary planners and they were already talking to autonomous vehicle robo taxi companies at that time. And I asked the question about, you know, was there, is there a need to provide sensors and other kinds of data? And they said they, they were told by the, the, the company, the robo taxi companies, don't do that. We, we want these to be these uh, robo taxis to be able to operate entirely on their own in the native environment, just like any other car would. But there seems to have been a switch in that thinking because now we're seeing local governments provide all sorts of data like geomaps and, and sensors and, and other kinds of data the car can use to maneuver in the city. Is that the case? Yes. Yeah. I think in an ideal world, we look at an autonomous vehicle and we think of it like the substitute for a human operating a vehicle and so since a human can use their brain and their senses to drive a vehicle no matter the environment the theoretically that we should expect the same from autonomous vehicles but obviously and i think for good reason the safety threshold for autonomous vehicles is much higher and that's why it, as a business it's so hard to scale because in all areas where robo taxis are operating, they are geofenced. You have to, essentially what you have to have are HD maps, high definition maps, which are like a digital twin of the operating area so that you can operate for it safely. And on top of that, things like vehicle connectivity, uh, 5G communications have, are important to the vehicle, not only to get an idea of what it's doing, but also, for example, if there's construction works or something, it needs to be able to get this information. Um, I know, for example, that Tesla claims that it doesn't require high definition maps, but as far as I'm aware, and in its current pilot operations in Austin, they still use them. It's something which you could argue that theoretically you don't need, but in, this, in the interests of public safety and regulations, I think it's necessary. And yeah, it's, it's the case currently for all robot taxis, but that's the case that you'll need uh, HD maps and these sensors. Now, apparently, uh, 5G, the cellular standard 5G, and vehicle-to-everything networks. Could you explain what a vehicle-to-everything network is? 
Uh, so from my understanding, a vehicle to everything network is just a way to, it's an all encompassing term, which basically says, can a vehicle communicate with not only other vehicles, which would be vehicle to vehicle, but for example, uh, yeah, other things uh, in the traffic, which you would get. And the idea is that you can communicate better to get a better idea of the environment um, and also yeah, the dynamic changes in that environment and you can adapt to them accordingly. So um, things like uh, coordinating with uh, like traffic signals uh, yes. with uh, construction sites, that sort of thing. Yes, yeah. So yeah, these would all be like use cases of vehicle connectivity, which would, which are necessary to make a vehicle operate safely. Yeah. Now, another thing that I'm interested in is batteries, because we've seen enormous innovation in batteries. And it would seem like for a robo taxi, which maybe it might operate 24 hours a day, um, stopping to charge a battery is not maybe the best uh, approach. But then you've got uh, automakers like uh, Neo that have swappable yes. battery stations. Uh, how is that playing out? Are we seeing swappable batteries uh, become popular with robo taxis? Uh, so interestingly, we mentioned CATL earlier, and I do believe that they're also developing some sort of battery swapping technology. Uh, I feel like we always come back to this thing, like how much money can they make, and more importantly, are they profitable? And robo taxis have one inherent advantage already. I mean, if I drive, if I'm a human driver of a taxi, I need to go home, I need to see my family, I need to eat, and I need to sleep. Whereas robo-taxis can operate all the time unless they have limitations in bad weather or at night time, um, as long as I have the fuel to drive me forward. Uh, at the moment, I don't think this is a major problem, especially in China where you have these batteries and a lot of electric vehicle charging infrastructure charging at significant C rates that it's really an issue as of yet. But like we've seen with the success of Neo's battery swapping, I wouldn't be surprised to see it become more prominent in the future for robo taxis. The we know now that the uh, Chinese EV makers have driven down the the, the capital costs of their vehicles. Uh, so you might have a ten thousand, fifteen thousand, twenty thousand uh, dollar EV uh, that's reasonably well made. Uh, yes. And given the fact that these uh, robo taxis put on a lot of kilometers, which then lowers your total cost of ownership, are we getting to the point where you know a, 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 a robo taxi ride is going to be pennies instead of many dollars? Um. I think this is, I think it would definitely take some time. Uh, but I mean, the big thing is obviously that if you, I'm not incentivized personally to take a robo taxi unless it's, it's cost competitive with a human taxi driver. And for sure, we can say that in terms of the increases of scale, uh, economies of scale in terms of manufacturing of the EV, but also, yeah, in terms of development and scaling up and the decreases in cost of additional hardware, LiDAR a few years ago cost thousands of dollars. Now it costs hundreds. Um, that this will all contribute to sort of, I guess, the cost of a robo taxi going down. Uh, we mentioned earlier the sort of the idea of uh, on vehicle monitors as well, you would have to pay them. And if you don't have them, then you don't have to pay them as much money. If your remote mo monitors can monitor fewer vehicles, then again, that costs less. And so these would all be driving the overall cost that the consumer gets, that we get down. Um, yeah, uh, but I guess it, um, sort of decreasing these costs comes into all sorts of areas as well. Yeah. Let's wrap up, <clears throat> let's wrap up this interview with a uh, question around AI. I want to return to that because AI has been dominating the, you know, the energy news for uh, many months now. And it seems like AI is the, the was the missing ingredient uh, to making robo taxis uh, safe and making them actually work, making them viable. Uh, what kind of innovations might we see in in, a, in AI that would continue to to advance the robo taxi uh, commercial viability? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, machine learning methods from the beginning were used for autonomous vehicles. Either they're being used to identify images, uh, like identify objects or identify how far away something is. So machine learning methods were always used. 
but the increased use of AI, which is important because a lot of these vehicle training data sets can now be generated by AI, for example. Um, but in terms of a vehicle side as well, being able to interpret these and operate them has been a big part of the development of convolutional neural networks for image generation. And more futuristically, instead of having all these hard-coded algorithms, these end-to-end -end neural networks, which essentially you feed the sensor data in, you don't have much or if any hard code at all. And it comes out with what it's what it perceives like from its training data to be the safest route. And I think the industry pers uh, perspective is that eventually all vehicles will be advancing to this sort of AI. Um, but yeah, at the moment, we still have a need for some sort of hard coded algorithms because sometimes these things will spit up or like a very confusing action, for example, and it's hard to unpack why that is in a regulatory perspective from like, if, if an accident happens, I can't justify why that's happened. But as these technologies improve and they're improving at an extremely rapid rate, we're gonna be expecting to see a lot more AI, not only in the or like off of driving the vehicle, but like I said, also for training data, uh, labeling of data, which is also a massive cost in developing autonomous vehicles technology. Well, John, thank you very much for this. Really appreciate it. Thank you.